Panic in the Streets with Richard Widmark is playing on Chapatula Street. The movie was filmed in New Orleans. Richard Widmark is a public health inspector who learns that a culture of cholera bacilli has gotten loose in the city. Kate watches, lips parted and dry. She understands my movie going, but in her own antic fashion. There is a scene which shows the very neighborhood of the theater. Kate gives me a look. It is understood that we do not speak during the movie. Afterwards in the street, she looks around the neighborhood. Yes, it is certified now. She refers to a phenomenon of moviegoing, which I have called certification. Nowadays, when a person lives somewhere in a neighborhood, the place is not certified for him. More than likely, he will live there sadly, and the emptiness which is inside him will expand until it, is, it evacuates the entire neighborhood. But if he sees a movie which shows his very neighborhood, it becomes possible for him to live, for a time at least, as a person who is somewhere and not just anywhere. That's from The Movie Goer by Walker Percy, published in 1960. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. This is class 37 of our Orthodox Survival Course. This section we're calling the Great Stereopticon. Today is session three, the movies, Hollywood, living the dream. That passage I read is from a favorite novel of mine, The Movie Goer by Walker Percy, a fellow Louisianian. Well, a transplanted Louisianian. He's actually from Birmingham that grew up in Greenwood, Mississippi, and then moved to New Orleans and spent his adult life mostly there. And uh, well, actually across the lake from New Orleans. And he's actually buried at the Benedictine Abbey, where I went to college and was once a novice in my Roman Catholic youth. Uh, M M Percy's point in the book, of course, is that uh, people nowadays, and he's right in 1960, he's right with Americans in the 20th century, um, see movies, or the life portrayed in movies, the virtual reality, as we'd say nowadays, portrayed in movies is more real than their own lives. And he's right back in 1960s. You can imagine how this affects people nowadays, you know, 60 years later. Just the other day, I was, well, not the other day, a, a while ago, but um, I was going through a pile of CDs at our house, and I found a collection of songs sung by Judy Garland, an American movie actress best known for her role as Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. The one actress, more than any other any other girl right, whose on-screen persona typified 20th century America's image of the girl next door. Okay. The program notes that came with the, in the box in the CD summarized her biography and ended, ended with these words. She lived the dream we all want to live. She lived the dream we all want to live. The curious thing is that the previous paragraph had ended with relating the circumstances of Garland's death at age 47 from a drug overdose. And the mini biography also had not omitted tragic details of her personal life from the time she became an asset of MGM as a young teenager. Self-loathing, drug addiction, multiple failed marriages, and so forth. The usual, you know, Hollywood story. When one does a little further reading, one also finds adultery and abortion at an early age. Also, no surprise. We do not know if Judy Garland intended to kill herself the night she died in London. It seems to have been an unintentional overdose. Whereas, of course, by that time, when you're so addicted and, and so depressed, everything's unintentional, so to speak, because your intentions have been captivated by the demons. Right? But she certainly killed herself first spiritually and finally physically, if not that night by wanting to commit suicide, and certainly by all her choices, the way she chose to live. She killed herself. But that's all right. That's all right, after all. She lived the dream we all want to live. <laughs> what more could one want? Recall the opening premise of this entire section of our course. The goal of the global elite 
is to create a new kind of human being to get back to Hillary's immortal words, redefine what it means to be human. Cinema, the defining art form of the 20th century, literally a great stereopticon, has by now so radically reshaped, that is deformed, the average person's idea of normality, of morality, of humanity, of the very purpose and meaning of life, that one could say that this goal of redefining humanity has more or less already been accomplished. In the minds of the overwhelming majority of people living in the developed world, maybe probably a lot of people in the undeveloped world, who usually get movie theaters and cell phones before they get running water. To most of the people living around us, what goes on in movies or television shows or YouTube videos is the really real. It is more real, it's more interesting than their own lives. It's far more compelling than the true good of the people they claim to love. I'm going to say that again. All that screen world is more compelling to them than the true good of the people they claim to love. They may not like or may not agree with everything they see on the screen. That's part of the fun, right? Yelling and disagreeing with whoever. But they cannot pull themselves away. It is a fatal attraction. Cinema, of course, wields far more power than the, our previous, the media we've already talked about, the newspapers or the radio. Cinema wields far more power than newspapers or radio, which we've already talked about. It retains the newspaper's appeal of vulgarity and superficial thought, masquerading as wisdom. And it retains the power of the radio, the power of the spoken voice. It also projects the primordial power of theater, which we've discussed last week, the Dionysian mystagogy we talked about last time. Oh, by the way, I need to make a correction. I called the god in my lecture on theater, I called the god Dionysus. When I was saying it in Greek, I said Dionysios. Dionysios is the name of someone named after the god. Dionysios means someone related to or of Dionysius, or a Dionysian person. But the god is named Dionysus, Dionysus. There's no I before the O at the end. Dionysus. So movies retain the power of theater that Dionysian mystagogy we talked about last time. And to add it to all this, taking the power of all these things we've already talked about, which in themselves are already very powerful, right? taking this power, quantum leaps, quantum leaps higher to a level never seen before in history. Okay? Cinema overwhelms the mind with stunning, captivating, and enthralling visual images along with powerful music and sound effects, right, the power of the soundtrack. Cinema constitutes a rich ensemble of so many art forms combined with so much power and effect. One can say with great confidence that never before was anything seen like this. Never before has there ever been anything like this in world history. And with few exceptions, the virtually irresistible might of this impossibly, heartbreakingly attractive thing, this, this pancreatic psychological superweapon that can enslave millions of souls over one weekend without anyone firing a shot. The power of this awesome thing has always been, since its beginning, it's always been the power of this superweapon, right? This global superweapon. It remains for the most part under the domination of men who hate God, hate Christ, hate the church, hate us, and want to destroy us. Men who serve the devil as their God. If we don't understand this, we don't understand what the movie industry is all about. I'm not saying the art form itself is diabolical, but the movie industry is diabolical. And if you don't accept that, you're living in la-la land. At this point, I want to disclose something. Probably like most of you listening to me right now, I like movies. 
especially older movies with absolutely no computer-generated graphics, which is anathema. I hate computer-generated graphics. And movies with good writing, good acting, in particular cinematic presentations of intelligent stage drama, or screenplays based on great literature. But because I like it so much, because it leaves such a deep impression on me, I rarely indulge in it. And when I do, it is for the most part with a very short list of plays or movies that are fairly innocent, or if they depict evil, render a genuinely moral judgment, and that I have watched repeatedly over many years. My, people who know me well probably laugh at me because I watch the same movies over and over again. Because I'm really afraid to venture out and watch anything else. It is precisely because we like it so much. Precisely because we like it so much. Because it leaves such a deep impression on us that we have to be very, very careful. Must be very careful. My point in saying this is that I don't think of myself standing on some orthodox version of an Olympus of hopelessly untouchable perfection, hurling down thunderbolts and saying, all right, if you all ever watch a movie, you're evil, you're doomed. That would be hypocritical. And worse, it would be a mistake. Because it would not motivate you to take realistic survival steps to deal with this powerful thing. And survival is what we're all about here. Let's recall that orthodox spiritual life is about reality, not reality television, <laughs> reality. We are supposed to be cleansing our minds and hearts of delusion and seeing things as they really are. How much time do we spend cleansing our minds of delusion? And how much time do we spend luxuriating in delusions? Yes, we're not consecrated hesychasts, right? We're not hermits, we're not monks. And there is room for art in life. And great art can lift us up above the banality of daily life and pierce our hearts with the joy of what is universally good and true and beautiful. It can lead us to God. But how much theater, cinema, television, and so forth is really this kind of art? Be honest. How much prayer and thought do we really put into discerning which selections of this mental food truly help us and our loved ones, especially little innocent children? How much time do we put into discerning which of them are, are at best, at best, a waste of time, and which, and which are actually spiritually poisonous? Let's be honest. We could do an entire survival course, an entire survival course just about movies, Maybe we should at some point in the future. But in this short talk, I can only hope to cover a few subtopics relating to cinema and offer a short list of practical suggestions. My approach in this lecture is to examine cinema in the good old days of the heyday of the silver screen and not address the problems with the medium that have developed since then. We might think that the problems with movies started with the Cultural Revolution of the 1960s, when drugs, sex, and rock and roll took over America, and then world culture. And that all the movies from the good old days, before the hippies and all that, are innocent. But this is not true. To understand any new historical development, including an art form, one must start at the beginning. And usually, the dominant and permanent characteristics of any enduring historical reality are present at the beginning and also easiest to observe at that point. I'll say that again. To understand any new historical development, including an art form, one must start at the beginning. And usually the dominant and permanent characteristics of any enduring historical reality are present at the beginning and also easiest to observe at that point. We cannot begin to develop our orthodox lens, our prism, to understand cinema by starting with movies produced in this decade of the 21st century. They are too close to us. And the problems with movies today are so extreme. And they're also they're constantly changing. Our reaction to these things would be just that, a reaction. right? 
to a kaleidoscopic and incomprehensible barrage of fragmentary impressions flung at us by extremely advanced media technology, the kind that exists today. Let's go back in time to that era of the 1920s to the 1950s, when it seemed like America was still America, right before all hell broke loose, and try to understand the underlying nature of cinema in order to create the understanding we need to deal with it as it exists today. I'm going to talk about cinema from an American point of view, not only because I'm an American and most of our audience are Americans, but also because cinema, like a lot of 20th century cultural movements, was basically cooked up in the laboratory of 20th century America. Remember, they, America was once a nation and they, certain people took it made it into a laboratory. They basically cooked it up in this laboratory of 20th century industrial America run by people who actually aren't Americans and then spewed this out to the rest of the world. Okay, They cooked it up in the laboratory and they got a big hose and spewed it out to destroy everybody else. Movie culture is the phony culture that replaced historic American culture and then became the world culture. I'll say that again. Movie culture the world of the cinema right, is the phony culture that replaced historic American culture or cultures because America is a quilt of, of identifiable historic cultures. Movie culture is the phony culture that replaced a historic American culture and then became the world culture. Okay. So this really is the great stereopticon. <laughs> Our guiding image of the great stereopticon that apt expression borrowed from Richard Weaver refers to the traveling magic lantern shows of 19th century America in which a projectionist could transport simple rural people to faraway times and places by the magic of colorful images thrown on a wall accompanied by a captivating storyline. The cinema is, of course, the magic lantern on steroids, as they say nowadays. We are so jaded today with television, movies, internet video, YouTube, and so forth, at the touch of a finger, right, on a personal device, we cannot imagine how overwhelmed people were in the 1920s or 1930s, first with the silent movies, and then with the talkies, right, sitting in a large, darkened auditorium, looking at a vast screen on which impossibly attractive or impossibly repulsive people far larger than life-size, engaged in various adventures of violence and romance, are saying or told jokes. Probably the only way to understand how they felt is if you went off to a monastery for a year, some strict monastery that limited communications media to a telephone and a computer in the abbot's office, and where all you did for weeks, for a whole year, was to pray, worship, do manual labor, read, have simple conversations, and deal with plants and animals. That would more or less recreate the life of a, a pre-industrial rural person or a small town person. Then when the year was up, you would come back to so-called real, which is up to, of course, unreal world, and go on a video binge, just watching movies and TV shows on a giant screen all day, and the very first day you came back. The shock of this would perhaps approximate what those people felt back when movies first came out. You would be overwhelmed. The attraction of the thing, no matter how much disgust you felt occasionally or <laughs> you felt often, the attraction of the thing would feel irresistible. You would realize, perhaps for the first time, how powerful this medium really is and how its unreality, posing as reality, can so rapidly replace the real things in your mind and your soul that you had acquired and treasured up during your year in the monastery. This is more or less what movies did to our forebears in the first half of the 20th century. A false vision of life replaced the examples of normal life, much less examples of holy life. 
as their paradigm for how they to think, talk, and behave. I'll say that again. With the movies, a false vision of life replaced the examples of normal life, much less the examples of a holy life, as their paradigm for how to think, talk, and behave. So what happens is the new movies then create a new normal. From its beginning, the movie industry set out to create a new self-image for the American people. Today, of course, what is presented as normal in the movies made now, 2019, what's presented as normal now in the movies is often unbelievably bizarre, utterly inhuman, and over overtly demonic, right? far beyond anything seen in the 1930s. But the old movies did enormous damage to the American character from the beginning by convincing ordinary people that their received way of life, based on church, family, ethnicity, local community, that they had this received way of life was uninteresting, contemptible, and that to be someone, they must start imitating the kind of character and the kind of society, the lifestyle, as we'd say nowadays, glorified on the silver screen. Sometimes the attack on traditional culture was overt. They just made fun of it just outright or put it down or said it was judgmental or too puritanical or stuff like that. But more often, this attack on the traditional culture at first was disguised. The good old ways are presented in a sentimental, superficial fashion that seems to praise them, but subtly trivializes them. And the hero or heroine transcends the old life by breaking old ties and embarking on a new, more exciting way of life. Right, That was good for mom and pop, but now I'm going to move on and be um, the modern man or the modern woman. Right. There are numerous themes that we could explore here. Like I said, we could do a whole course on this. But I'll address three of them. Big city life as the new normal. Big city life as the new normal. The revolution in domestic mores. And the fascination with criminality. Until World War II, most Americans still lived in small towns or farming communities and most lived as members of extended families and local cultures that were by today's standards unbelievably homogeneous in race, language, and religion. Even in the big cities, the immigrant communities lived in tight-knit neighborhoods conceived on a human scale. Everybody lived within a few blocks. They could walk everywhere, right? See how their, their relatives, their friends, their neighbors spoke the same language, went to the same church, and so forth a life centered on family life, and most often with the, these particular immigrant communities that are the, really the bulwark of anything healthy in 20th century urban culture, most often Roman Catholic parish institutions. We Orthodox are such a small percentage, it doesn't really, I'm sure spiritually, by the grace of God, impacted the culture, but outwardly, it, you know, we're a little percent of a percent of American culture. So most often these tight-knit communities were Roman Catholic parish they were centered on Roman Catholic parish institutions, church, school, social organizations, designed to preserve both religious and ethnic identity, and we have to give them credit, they did a good job. So that's their real life, okay, that's the real life the Americans were living, either the, the old, um, mostly British or Northern European or Protestant population living in small towns or in the, in the farms, then the, the new, that is, people for the latter half of the 19th century, the Catholic immigrants, the Catholic Germans, Irish, Italians, and so forth, living in their ethnic, the Poles, living in their ethnic neighborhoods centered around church, family, and so forth, speaking their own language, having their own radio station, having their own newspapers, um, and so forth and so on. I mean, I remember in rural Louisiana, my grandfather listening to the lo local French radio station. But if a visitor from another planet, as they say, another planet, as the expression goes, <laughs> planets, a visitor from another planet, as the expression goes, 
learned about the 1930s America not from visiting these real people, not from going to, you know, the Greek neighborhood in Astoria or um, going to Hillsdale, Michigan in 1935 or wherever. We learned about 1930s America only from watching movies. He would conclude that the paradigmatic American was a deracinated, lonely, irreligious, restless, iconoclastic, fast-talking, and fast-living denizen of New York or Chicago or some awful place like that, and that his life consisted of the pursuit of money, power, and love affairs. He would deduce that nearly all American women are impossibly beautiful, that they all dress and comport themselves like prostitutes, and that they all smoke cigarettes. He would observe that the small town or the old ethnic neighborhood and family life, when they are portrayed, are presented, even when they are depicted lovingly, as a situation to be escaped from or grown out of in order to live the cosmopolitan life of the big city. Even if you grow up in the big city and say you're in your, your Polish or Irish neighborhood, you have to escape that and go into the right the cosmopolitan life where everybody's mixed up together and they're living the fast life, right? To live for oneself or one's romantic love interest. I know that one can excessively idolize small town and rural life. My point here is not to idol, uh, uh, idealize or idolize small town or rural life. Of course, they were never perfect in any nation at any time, including Orthodox nations, because everyone is sinful. Real life is always beset by the passions of those who are living that life and by the demons. We all know that. But it is also undeniable that God's plan for the temporal social order in order to make man's eternal purpose more attainable for ordinary people is based on the life of the nuclear and extended families and of small, local, stable communities of people sharing one faith, one language, one ethnicity, and one culture who are born, live, and die in the same place, often on the same piece of land, even in the same house. I'm going to say that again. It is undeniable that God's plan for the temporal social order in order to make man's eternal purpose more attainable for ordinary people is based on the life of the nuclear and extended families and of small, local, stable communities of people sharing one faith, one language, one ethnicity, and one culture who are born, live, and die in the same place, often on the same piece of land, even in the same house. This is just normal human life. It's just a starting point, right, for sainthood. I'm not talking about sainthood. I'm talking about just being a human being. This is what enables the stability and wholeness of the psyche that forms the best starting point for the life of the spirit. The fact that my simply saying this in 2019 can get me accused, even sad to say by some Orthodox people, of intolerance and racism and a variety of other ideological thought crimes shows how completely insane our life has become. This normal human life in the small town or the farm is lived at a slow pace. It does not encourage competition or aggression and therefore it creates a patient gentle character, not inclined to arrogance or boasting, and generally open to the goodness of life. Life has a gift, right? The unbought grace of life that Edmund Burke talks about, the unbought grace of life. The cosmopolitan life, on the other hand, lived in an atmosphere of hurry and aggression, of endless competition, creates a nervous unstable, smart aleck character. The smart aleck, Yankee character you see in all the old movies, right? Given to wisecracking remarks, arrogance, and cynicism. We can see a comic caricature of this in the Three Stooges characters, 
for example. They're a, uh, they're a, a ludicrous or burlesque of this kind of character. Okay. In general, we can say that the big city life makes for a hardening and coarsening of character, even in people who intend to be moral and good. It lowers the tone of life and deflects man from his proper temporal purposes and, above all, from his eternal destiny. But the small-town American, watching a movie in the 1930s, saw this lower, coarser kind of life presented as glamorous and desirable. These people are better than y'all. They're, they're more interesting, right? They're movie stars. It created in his mind a new normal. And along with the big city life presented as normal came, of course, the sexual revolution. Even when an old-fashioned romantic movie ends in a wedding, which they often did, right? Usually the hero and heroine have already behaved in ways that, well, to be polite, fall short of the standards of the church. Also, the emphasis is not at all on marriage as a sacred or social institution involving duty and self-sacrifice. The emphasis is on marriage as a form of romantic love affair with constant sexual overtones. And if, if you don't think that, that those old movies are, were highly sexual, it's only because you're jaded. Right? Those, uh, if you haven't watched any movies for a long time, and you'd watch a 1930s or 1940s movie with some of these beautiful actresses, you'd realize that, you know, this creates warfare, right? It's a temptation to see women portrayed in such a way and relationships between men and women portrayed in such a way. I'm going to say this again. The emphasis is not at all on marriage as a sacred or social institution involving duty and self-sacrifice but on marriage as a form of romantic love affair with constant sexual overtones. This by itself, even if actual fornication or actual adultery are never condoned in the story, even if they are condemned in the story, this by itself, the way they present marriage as a romance, right, is a fatal derogation from the traditional paradigm of marriage regarded primarily as the essential social institution involving sacred, social, and intergenerational moral and legal obligations, not even to mention a derogation from the higher and distinctly ascetic demands of the church's sacramental marriage. Now let's get back to poor Judy Garland. One of her lesser-known movies presents a perfect stereotype for the purely romantic marriage as the cinematic norm. It's called The Clock. I imagine most of you have never heard of it. We all know about the Wizard of Oz and probably some know about the Andy Hardy movies and so forth. But it's called The Clock. Today it would be called a chick flick, or I guess maybe back in my heyday in the 1980s they called them chick flicks. I don't know if they call them now. <clears throat> to our jaded 21st century sensibilities, this movie would appear hopelessly charming, even innocent. Right? But it's not innocent. It's terrible. It depicts just about everything I've just been talking about. Marriage seen almost entirely as a romantic adventure. The unnatural speed of city life. Deracination. A condescending sentimentalization of family life, a sentimentalization of religion, and so forth. You can read the plot summary at Wikipedia article. Yeah, I know Wikipedia is not the most trustworthy source for important things, but I think we can trust Wikipedia to summarize ridiculous movie plots. And I put the link here in the notes. So The Clock with Judy Garland and a poor man named Robert Walker who died very young. So what do we see in this movie? Two strangers, in New York of course, meet and get married within 48 hours. The, the boy is... Uh, a serviceman on on furlough, right? Of course, he's the hero of you know the good war, you know the GI GI Joe. He's in New York, 
meets a girl over the weekend, falls in love, marries her. What could be more all-American, right? There is a nod. In the movie, there is a nod to family life. There's a character, the nice milkman, who brings the, the boy and the girl home and his wife fix some breakfast after a night where they help the milkman deliver his milk. It's a very charming scene, right? Of course, these movies are attractive because they are so charming. <clears throat> the milkman and his wife are or the milkman and his wife in their little home in New York, they're a foil of normality, right? To the main character's fevered instability, their abnormality. There is a nod to religion. The heroine wants to kneel in a church and recite their vows again to feel married. They go and get married by a magistrate, a justice of the peace or whatnot, and then, um, but she doesn't feel married, right? She's a, still a, like right. she's Judy Garland. I mean, she's the girl next door. She wants a church wedding, but they go and kneel in an empty church and they just repeat their vows by themselves. Right? It's like the ultimate low church marriage. Right? The sentimental churchgoer who wants to feel good about enjoying the movie, right? Because deep down he knows I really shouldn't be enjoying this movie. This is crazy, but he wants to feel good about it. So he says, "Look, you see those old movies, those good old-fashioned movies. They showed people who believe in God." But obviously, the movie presents an anarchic and dangerous understanding of marriage. The protagonists are completely severed from traditional loyalties and act as isolated individuals. There's little atoms flowing around in the poisonous broth of modernity. Right? They're clinging to little lost souls, clinging to each other in the impersonal world of cosmopolitan modernity. They make this incredibly important decision <laughs> based on sexual attraction and romantic emotion without any reference to their parents, with no reference to religious or social duty or tradition or, or the long-term consequences of their decision. And this entire modern big city fairy tale also carries the sanction of the Good War. Right? This is 1945. So by 1945, Americans have been brainwashed to believe that the, their country's part in World War II, you know, they were the good guys. This is some kind of holy crusade. Right? And more importantly, that the social havoc created by the war, and the war was a key element in the social engineering of the United States to make it into this unrecognizable monstrosity we have today. More importantly, they were convinced by the holiness of World War II, right, that the social havoc created by the war, the new kind of society that emerged from it was also holy, right, had the, the aura of the great victory over the evil devil Hitler, right? It was a progression to something higher and better than that mom and pop life before the great social experiment that the war somehow justified. Before the war, a teenage Judy Garland, playing opposite Mickey Rooney in the Andy Hardy movies, typified the girl next door of small town life, and small town loves. Now Judy and America have grown up. It's 1945 now. They've grown up in that great social engineering experiment known as World War II. And she is the girl next door no more. But the completely chimerical, I mean, she is fairly chimerical in the Andy Hardy movies, right? But now she's a completely chimerical and insubstantial glamour girl of the greatest generation, right? The girl with nylons who smokes cigarettes. Someone who is attractive precisely because she is not familiar. She's foreign. Like for another planet, as they say. The small town young woman says, I want to be like that. I want to be like Judy Garland. And the small town young man says, I want a girl like that. This is the generation, the, the misnamed greatest generation, right? This is the generation that gave birth to and raised the baby boomers, my generation arguably the most selfish and despicable generation in American history up to that point. Our parents, who were the young people watching The Clock in 1945 down at the Main Street movie theater, still believed in faithful love and marriage. Our parents did believe in these things. And they believed in having children. They had big families. 
and they believed in going to church and being involved in a law-abiding community. But their image of all these good things was profoundly deformed by Hollywood. And this false image seriously damaged their lives. It affected, it, it really debilitated how they reared their children, which is why we turned out to be so rotten. <clears throat> Besides creating a false idea of family and marriage, Hollywood also glamorized criminal behavior. Remember Paterim Sorokin, the Russian-American sociologist I referred to, in his book, The Crisis of Our Age, and by the way, uh, you'll probably never read Sorokin's Monium Opus, his, this huge multi-volume work he wrote, but if you want to get to know Sor Sorokin's thought, just read The Crisis of Our Age, so one volume introduction or summary of his thought. In this book, The Crisis of Our Age, Sorokin points to the rise in the genre of crime literature, cops and robbers tales, detective stories, and so forth, that started in the 19th century and then just exploded in the 20th century. But he points to this as a mark of a corrupt, dying culture. Now, again, I have to make a true confession. I, I love some detective stories. I love especially Dorothy Sayers' Lord Peter Wimsey character, and to a lesser extent, Hercule Poirot in Agatha Christie. Right? These are attractive interesting characters, they're, they're intelligent stories. But, the, but let's be honest, when a culture becomes preoccupied with the l lower kinds of behavior, even to condemn it, okay, well, we're condemning it, you know, we're, we're against that, the crooks, we're for, for the cops. Even when you, you're condemning it, you're still preoccupied with it, right? That's a mark of a dying culture. Cops and robbers and all that. So it's a mark of a corrupt, dying culture. Movies took this, the whole cops and robbers or detective genre, and ran with it. Even when the gangster characters, played by James Cagney or Edgar G. Robinson, get what's coming to them, right? Justice is served in the end. They still seem, they still seem somehow attractive, right? In their very villainousness. Villainousness, they're, they're, you know, they're bad guys, but they're still, you know, there's a yeah, kind of attractive, you know, they're, they're interesting people. They are more real, more alive somehow than one's law-abiding parents or teachers or pastor or the people next door. The criminal subculture plays an inherent role in the very attractiveness of big city life, right, because that's where the, that's where the crime culture festers and brews, um, you know, that's in the big city. The s s criminal subculture exemplifies the big city fevered pace, right? The feeling of living on the edge, the seduction of danger. We could go on and on, of course, but we're not. <laughs> Perhaps we should continue this subject of the movies in our next talk. But for now, what about some survival tips? Here is a short list. One, constantly remind yourself that movies are very powerful. And if you must watch them, be very careful about what you choose. Frankly, if you never watched a movie again the rest of your life, you would really be, wouldn't be missing much. Let's be honest. But if you must watch them, be very careful about what you choose. Be very critical of what you see. An Orthodox Christian should never just run down to the video store or download a movie off the internet or go to the theater to watch the latest offering just because, you know, everybody else is doing it. Second, don't immerse yourself in movie or TV culture. It should be an occasional diversion and indulgence now and then. Because after all, we're just regular folks, right? It should be an occasional indulgence a diversion, not a daily aspect of life. Not You don't live in that world. Right? Third, and here's suge a concrete suggestion about what kind of things to watch, dignified cinematic productions based on truly great literature, a screenplay, a faithful screenplay that really represents a, a universally um, good and true and beautiful piece of literature, right? or a classic drama, are to be preferred. But the basic message here is let's live real lives and not try to live the dream that killed poor Judy Garland. May Christ God, our Savior, whose great and saving passion we're about to celebrate next week in Great and Holy Week, 
May he send our guardian angels to guard our minds and thoughts and lead us securely in the path of salvation. To him be the glory with the Father and the Holy Spirit to the ages of ages. Amen.